open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 2. And here's my disappointment for today. Because we're putting on this wonderful event that you need to come back to and bring somebody to this evening, Harvest America. Because we're doing this event, it means that I'm not doing my normal message this evening. I'm only preaching on this text twice today instead of three times. I I might come back in the middle of the night and preach this to an empty room. (laughs) Just because such an amazing text, I, you know, it seems like cheating to give it only two messages here on a Sunday. So anyway, John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you are present with us. We thank you for your amazing grace, your amazing love. And now we pray that as we give our attention to your word, that your spirit would have free reign among us to speak to us, to to encourage us, to convict us where necessary, to do your precious work among us in and through your word. Speak to us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter two, beginning now at verse one. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. We're making our way through the Gospel of John here on Sundays, and now we come to chapter 2 in this great event that's usually known as the Wedding of Cana, where Jesus miraculously turned water into wine. And in the entire structure of John's Gospel, this is a very important point. It's a very pivotal place. As he's going to say at the end of our text, this is the first of the signs that Jesus did in his ministry. And each one of these signs is calculated to bring us to faith or to a deeper faith in Jesus Christ. And it all begins with Jesus and his disciples up in the area of Galilee. The last time we saw them in the Gospel of John, they were down in the area of Judea. But now they're up in the area of Galilee at a place called Cana. And look at what it says there in verse 2. Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. You know, this is really a remarkable thing, isn't it? That Jesus was invited to a wedding. That he was welcome there. I want you to think about this, especially I want you to consider what a wedding was in the Jewish culture of that time. In the Jewish culture of that day, a wedding was the best party ever. Absolutely it was. It was supposed to be the most memorable day and the funnest day, or actually since they often had them over a series of days, the most fun series of days that a person would ever enjoy in their whole life. It was the ultimate party, a wedding feast. And doesn't it tell you something very powerful that Jesus and his disciples were actually invited to this wedding? Doesn't that tell you something about the kind of man Jesus was? Jesus was not a killjoy. Jesus was not somebody who looked around, tried to see if anybody was having a good time and stop them if they were. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus comes to this wedding, he's going to do a miracle. And the miracle is entirely calculated to increase the fun at this wedding, to not put a damper down on it. I'll tell you what, Jesus is not going to preach a sermon at this wedding. Jesus is not going to lead a prayer meeting. He's going to enjoy the wedding feast, the good time among his friends, among his neighbors, among his people for what it was. And I'll tell you something, just in verses 1 and 2, there's something so powerful for us to get a hold of. Because isn't there such a thing as sort of this religious spirit that can creep into people's hearts and minds and says, if you're having a good time, you must be in sin. If you're simply enjoying life and the good things that God has given us to enjoy in this world, there must be something wrong with you. Friends, God loves it when his people have a good time. Matter of fact, heaven is going to be joyful. Do you believe that? Heaven is going to be joyful. Don't be surprised if God gives you many previews of heaven here on earth. Now look, we understand that each one of us in our walk with God, we have our afflictions, we have our tribulations, we have our sorrows to bear, and we don't deny that, nor do we despise it. But doesn't it make us appreciate the just wonderful celebration, fun times that God gives us? And so Jesus was here at this wedding. It also shows us something else, that Jesus loves to dignify weddings with his presence. Almost every time that I perform a wedding ceremony, I invoke this idea that Jesus' first miracle was done at a wedding. He loved 
to have his presence there at a wedding. And I believe that a wedding isn't really much of anything unless Jesus Christ can be present there, solemnizing and adding joy to the whole occasion by his presence. But it also shows us a third thing. It tells us that every time we invite Jesus into the events of our life, something good is going to happen. I just want you to consciously think about that. you got a whole week in front of you. Probably you got your smartphone there. I know you got your Bible open, but you might be looking at your calendar for the next week because you're not even thinking much about what I'm saying. You're thinking about the week ahead of you. As you look at that calendar, you'd see all these events, maybe appointments, maybe duties, maybe things that you have to do. I want you to consciously be aware that you're going to invite Jesus' presence at every one of those events. Now, you might kind of fatalistically say, well, he's there with me anyway. No, no, but there's something different when you consciously invite the presence of Jesus at these things. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to come and make whatever you have in your life better by his presence. Well, there was a problem at this particular wedding. Look what happens here at verse 3 where we see. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you to do, do it. My friends, this is interesting. This is tantalizing for people who like to study the Bible. Because this gives us some unique insight into the relationship between Jesus and his mother. Now notice this, first of all, there's a little bit of a problem. Verse 3 tells us that they ran out of wine. Friends, this was a major social faux pas. Because it would ruin the wedding and it might damage the reputation of the bridal couple in that community forever. You know, this was a small town. People talk. People don't forget things. And when you run out of wine at a wedding, you've made such a mistake. And people wonder, why did they run out of wine? Now, there's some Bible interpreters and such. They say, well, the disciples were unexpected invitations. And maybe they drank a lot of wine. And so maybe the presence of his friends, there's no evidence of that from the text. I don't think that's it. I think that's likely what happens to us sometimes. Look, you're on a tight budget. You kind of maybe lowball the estimate for how much you need, and you hope for the best. Sometimes you get by with that, right? Other times you don't. And whatever the exact reason, in the middle of the wedding party, they realized we're running out of wine and this is going to be a major social embarrassment. Friends, there are ancient records, writings that we have, of lawsuits in wedding parties because the gift wasn't suitable enough that the guest brought. Lawsuits in that day. It is possible, and I know it's a bit of a stretch. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of ambiance. It's possible that not only did this open them up to social embarrassment, it might have opened them up to legal action. Because they put on a party and they didn't provide for it adequately. So Jesus' mother, Mary, brings the request to Jesus. And she says to him, we have no wine. And friends, we don't know exactly why Mary brought the request. Most people assume, and I guess it's a pretty good assumption. Most people assume that somehow Mary had a relationship with the bridal couple. We're not told this in the text. But I guess it's okay. It's a pretty safe assumption. Mary had some kind of relationship with the bridal couple. That's why she was there. That's why she's in the know. And that's why Jesus and his disciples were invited. But what's most engaging to us is Jesus' reaction. Did you see that in verse 4? Look at what he says. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? First of all, we notice something. How Jesus addressed his mother. He did not address her by Mother Mary. No, he addressed her by saying woman. Now, this is one of the difficulties that we come when we're trying to translate the Bible into different languages. You know how it works when you're translating from one language to another, that sometimes it's very hard to find equivalent words in different languages. From what I've understood by reading the background and reading the Greek scholars on this, we have no adequate English word that translates what Jesus said to his mother when he said woman. It's not an insult. It's not like he's saying, hey, you know, girl, or something like that. I don't know. Just think of some derisive term. It's not an insult, but neither is it particularly warm. It's like saying lady or madame or something like that. But it's not particularly warm, but neither is it an insult. Jesus was not being rude to his mother in the slightest way. However, he was not appealing to her 
on the mother-son relationship at all. And friends, there's something very significant, and I think even pretty dramatic as this. As a matter of fact, it's as if Jesus was saying to her, he's saying, Mom, I'm not your son anymore. Not, Not that I've divorced you or anything like that. But I have a new relationship in my life that must dominate now that I have started on my public ministry. First and foremost, I am not your son. I am the son of my father in heaven. That's why he said to her, did you see those words? What does your concern have to do with me? You see, with this question, Jesus seemed to say to Mary, I I won't do it. It's not time for me to do it. Doesn't that seem to be that Jesus' response is to her? but yet he went on to do it. And this kind of makes us scratch our head. Jesus, why do you make it sound to your mother like you're not gonna do it, but then you go ahead and do it? Friends, I think that this was the attitude of Jesus in this. It's as if what he really said to Mary was this, mother, although he didn't say mother, he said woman, woman, now we have a different relationship. Don't try to appeal to me as your son because we got a different relationship now. Now, I take my orders exclusively from my heavenly Father. And Jesus must have right then prayed and known what to do because this Gospel of John has repeatedly Jesus saying that many times in this Gospel, he says, I don't do anything unless my Father tells me to do it. And I'm convinced that's what Jesus did. He said, woman, we've got a different relationship now. Don't appeal to me as your son because I've got a surpassing relationship now. It's that which I have with my heavenly father. I'm gonna pray and seek what my heavenly father's will is and we're gonna go on from there. And he did and obviously Jesus must have got the go ahead from his heavenly father to act in this particular situation. But it wasn't because Mary asked him, it's because he consulted his heavenly father. Now Mary must have sensed this because notice her reply in verse five, it's great words. Mary said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Friends, isn't that great advice? I could just say that. That is the word of the Lord for you today. Whatever Jesus says to you to do, do it. Isn't that so straightforward and simple? If Jesus tells you to do something, do it. The recorded words of Mary are very few. In the Gospel of Luke, we have Mary's song, her Magnificat, and that's a beautiful song. Other than that song that she sings, the recorded words of Mary are very few in the Bible. But what we have from her are very precious. And this word in particular is great. Mary, the mother of Jesus, says to everybody who's interested in Jesus, whatever he says to you to do, do it. And she was saying that to the servants. So notice what happens next. Verse 6. Now there were six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. Okay, so can you picture this in your mind? Two big, excuse me, six big urns. They're like these big water pots containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So in total, you're talking somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of liquid present there. And these are pots according to the purification customs of the Jews. In other words, it was very important in the Jewish world of that day to use water in a ceremonial sense for cleansing. And if you were having a big wedding feast with a lot of guests, then they would have to come in and do a little ceremonial washing. And then between the courses of the meal, they do a little ceremonial washing. You needed to have a lot of water present, and that's why they had this 120 to 180 gallon water supply right there for the wedding feast. And notice there, there's the six water pots of stone, and Jesus says to the servants, verse seven, did you notice that? Fill the water pots with water. Now, imagine yourself being one of the servants at Jesus' wedding party here. Here you have the servants who are saying, well, okay, fill the water pots with water. Can I just say that that's a big, bad work? I don't know how full the water pots were at the time. Let's just estimate they were half full. You're talking about loading anywhere from 60 to 90 gallons of water within a, a, a short amount of time. Friends, they didn't have a garden hose to do it. They got to go to a well. They got to pump the water. They got to carry it over. Jesus just told these servants to do a lot of work. Now, why? I don't mean to spoil the story, but Jesus is going to make wine out of the water that fills those pots. 
I didn't blow the story for anybody, did I? Now, that's a pretty impressive miracle, don't you think? The God that can transform water into wine, can't he just create the water within the pots as well? Could not have Jesus, with the thought of his mind, or the word of his mouth, or the wave of his hand, could he not have instantly filled those pots with water as well? Couldn't have the text said something like this? And they turned to the water pots, and they were filled with wine. It could have very easily said that, but that's not the way Jesus did it. Do you know why? Because even when God does something flat out miraculous, so often, I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but so often he delights in having some form of human participation in it. Don't you see what Jesus is doing with the servants? He's looking at those servants, those anonymous servants. We don't know the name of a single one of them. He's going to those servants and he's saying, I want you to share in my miraculous work. I want you and I, after this is done, and say, yeah, we did something pretty cool, didn't we? Now, what do the servants do? In a sense, they did nothing. They did anything anybody could do. But Jesus says, you do what you can do, and I'm going to do what no man can do. I'm going to do a miracle with it. And friends, that's so often the way that God works. Even when he does something flat out miraculous, it doesn't exclude human participation. It invites human participation. The servants didn't do the miracle. Their efforts of filling the water pots with water by themselves were nothing. But combined with what only Jesus could do, a mighty miracle happened. And I'll tell you what, those servants were especially blessed because did you see what it says there in verse 7? How did they fill the water pots? To the brim. Up to the brim. Now imagine if these were slacking servants of God. And Jesus says, fill the water pots with water. And what do they do? They go, well, why? Uh, well, well, when? Well, how full? Can't you just see, isn't that many times the way we respond to God in our service? God puts it on your heart. He calls you through people in your life. He, he just impresses it on you one way or another. Do this for me. And we say, well, why? Well, when? Well, how much? Servants didn't ask any of those questions. What did they do? Right away they did it without hesitating in the slightest. And they filled the water pots without asking a question. And they filled them to the brim. And I want you to think about it. Later on, you know what's going to happen. Again, I hope I'm not spoiling this for anybody. All the water in those water pots is going to turn to wine. Think if they would have only filled them half full. The effectiveness of the miracle would have only happened in half measure. But because they filled them to the brim, because they were diligent in doing what they could do, this miracle's effectiveness was going to be filled to the very fullest that anybody could see. So notice now, verse 7, it says, they filled them up to the brim. Now notice this. This tells us something else. And this is something I saw in this text this week that just delighted me so much. They filled it up to the brim, meaning Jesus could add nothing to what was in those pots. Right? They're all full. There's no room for Jesus to add something to those water pots. It's not like he walked by with some wine concentrate and flipped it into the water pots. There's no room to add anything because Jesus doesn't want to add something to those water pots. He wants to transform what's in it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a picture for how God wants to work in your life. So often we think that Jesus just wants to add something to our life. Okay, let's add something. We'll add a little love. We'll add a little patience. We'll add a little self-control. We'll add a little whatever it is that you need in your life. Oh, Lord, just add a little peace to my life. Friends, listen, I believe God wants your life to be filled with love and patience and self-control and his grace and all of it. But he just doesn't want to add it to your life. He wants to utterly transform your life. And so Jesus has these pots filled to the brim, not because he intends to add, he intends to transform. And friends, this is a pattern for our own faith and obedience. Here's something that Charles Spurgeon said about this. He said, when you are bidden to believe in him, believe in him up to the brim. When you are told to love him, love him up to the brim. When you are commanded to serve him, serve him up to the brim. 
That's how God invites us to serve him and love him and listen to him to the fullest amount of our capacity up to the very brim. So what happens next? Look at it here at verse eight where we read. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and they did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning that sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. I'm absolutely blown away by Jesus' action here. He has the servants fill it up to the brim and then immediately, we suppose, immediately he says, I want you to take some of what's in that water pot and take it to the master of the feast. Sort of the master of the ceremonies. He was the guy responsible for the whole party collectively. Now notice this, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. Don't you think this took faith on behalf of the servants? I wonder. I wonder if they smelled what came out. Did it smell like water? Did it smell like wine? Could you imagine the insult of bringing water to the master of the feast and saying, look, drink this? But they did it by faith. They did it by faith because Jesus told them to do it. They didn't see Jesus do anything. You know, we don't even know how this miracle was done. Jesus didn't clap his hands. He didn't say abracadabra. He didn't pray a prayer. Jesus' divine credentials are shown in that he simply thought a thought and something was utterly transformed from water into wine. The servants go and they take it to the master of fee the feast. In faith, they obeyed the word of Jesus. And you know what else blows my mind about this? Jesus insisted that the miracle be put to the test and be put to the test right away. He, he didn't command that the water be made wine and that it first be served to the guests, but to the master of the feast. It's as if Jesus said this, test it and test it by the proper authority and do it now. And friends, I think there's something very instructive for us today. Let me say that I believe that our God is a miracle working God. And that God does tremendous miracles. And I've seen them with my own eyes. And I've experienced them with my own life. And under ministries that I've been connected with, I've seen and experienced God do stupendous miracles over the years. But let me say this. In the Christian world today, there's a lot of foolishness that happens and is claimed to be a miracle. There are people who say, you're healed. And they're not healed. Now listen, I believe that God is a God of healing and I have seen God miraculously heal people and I trust that God wants to heal more people and not less. But let's be real, if God heals somebody, you should be able to go to your doctor and prove it. If God does a miracle, it should be able to be proven. Take it to the master of the feast. Let him taste the wine. If it's for real, everybody's gonna see it. And when there's foolishness that's claimed to be miracles, I believe it's our responsibility. And friends, I know this is an unpopular thing to say in this day and age in the Christian world. There are people who believe that if you say anything negative about what is purported to be a miracle, that somehow you're quenching the spirit of God. I say no, because the spirit of God is the spirit of truth. And I rejoice in any true miracle that's done. But when there is foolishness that's claimed to happen miraculously in the name of Christ, it should be exposed. It should be exposed for the kind of foolishness that it is. And no claimed miracle should ever be afraid of right up front verification. I believe strongly on that. I think you can tell. Because I do not want the church to be deceived and to run after foolishness in the name of Christ. Look, that might be an exciting buzz for a moment, but it ends badly every time. It ends with people forsaking the faith because it's not true. If it's true, it'll stand up to verification. That's exactly the pattern we see here. Take it to the master of the feast. So they did it. And what did the master of the feast? He said, verse 10, you have kept the good wine until now. 
Isn't this beautiful? The master of the feast paid the bridegroom a great and public compliment. You see, running out of wine would have meant social disgrace and maybe even financial ruin for that occasion. And what Jesus did was he transformed this element of what might have been absolute social disgrace and he translated it into social victory for that bridegroom couple. Now the bridegroom couple say, yeah, well, I guess we did save the best wine until now. You know, we planned it that way all along. You know, we brought out the best vintage, you know, the best wine list right now. And can I say this? When Jesus made wine, it was good wine. It doesn't mean that it had a particularly high alcohol content, but it does mean that it was good wine. I guess I need to talk about this because this is the appropriate place to talk about it. There are some people, there are some people that I greatly respect and love in the body of Christ who take a look at this text. And basically what they say is, Jesus didn't make wine, he made grape juice. Because they're afraid of giving Christians the license to drink wine or alcoholic beverages. And they say, it's better for us to deny that Jesus actually made wine here than it is to give anybody in the Christian world the license to drink alcohol. Friends, I gotta tell you, I, myself, I'm a teetotaler. I abstain from alcohol. Now, uh, I just don't drink it. But first and foremost, I am a Bible man. And even though I believe that my position of not drinking alcohol is a very responsible one to take as a leader in God's family, and one I recommend to others who are leaders in God's family, first and foremost, I am a Bible man. And I cannot tell you with integrity that the Bible forbids the moderate use of alcohol. It doesn't. The Bible does not forbid the moderate use of alcohol. Jesus made wine. They drank wine at this wedding. Now, it is well to keep two things in mind in regard to this. Number one, from everything we know about the wine that they drank in this day, by today's standards, it would be greatly watered down. I've heard that they either watered it down one part to two or two parts to three, but they greatly watered down the wine. So was it possible to get drunk on this wine? Yes, it was possible, but you'd have to be determined to do it. You might get a stomach ache before you got drunk on this wine, but you could do it. But the second thing to remember, and I think this is even bigger, you have to remember that in Jewish culture of that day, drunkenness was an incredible disgrace. There was a very strong social prohibition in the Jewish day, uh, in the Jewish world of that day against drunkenness. And that kept a very effective tamper on people getting drunk. I don't think that Jesus for one moment increased the likelihood that people would get drunk at this wedding. I don't think Jesus would say, hey everybody, I made more wine, get as wasted as you wanna get. No way. And as Christians, if you feel that God has given you the liberty to drink, I will not judge you, but I will tell you this as your pastor. Number one, beware of drunkenness. Not only is drunkenness a sin in itself, but it leads to so many other sins. Think about how many irresponsible and even immoral things that happen because people's reason has been affected because of their drinking. That's number one. Drunkenness is a sin and you should take it seriously. Number two, if you are under the power of an addiction, you should have no business with it. None whatsoever. You should not be under the power of anything, no addiction, no uh, mastering principle in your life to where you are a slave to alcohol or any other addictive substance. And number three, if you feel that God has given you the liberty to drink, then I would say this is your passive. Pastor, be obvious and be even excessive in your moderation. Let everybody see that you drink in moderation. I don't know exactly how you would communicate that, but I'd say this, maybe if you have a glass of wine, don't drain it. Leave a little bit at the end. Anybody who looks and go, wow, man, they don't even drink the whole cup. Look at that. Do something, act in a way that makes everybody see that you are moderate in your drinking habits and that you don't need to rely on alcohol to have a good time. How sad is that? How sad is that that people need to rely on 
any outside stimulant or depressant, as alcohol actually is, to have a good time. No, but I think that there's a bigger principle here. Look at what he says there in verse 10. He says, you have kept the good wine until now. Friends, there is a great principle based on those words. And this is a principle that for the people of God, the best always comes last. Isn't that funny? That's completely different. Think about the seductive promises that this world makes us. Think about the way that people think in the world. They always think that the best comes first. And the worst comes last. Friends, that's not how it is in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, no matter how good you think it is now, God has better things for you later. No matter how wonderful you think it is, God has blessed you now, God has better for you later. No, for God, the best is always yet to come, and that is always and ultimately fulfilled with our destiny with him in heaven. Isn't that it? No matter how blessed you think you are in this life, the best is yet to come. God always saves his best for the last. Let me read to you again something from Charles Spurgeon. He says, I can conceive you, brethren, in the very last moment of your life, or rather, in the first moment of your life, saying, he has kept the best wine until now. When you begin to see him face to face, when you enter into the closest fellowship with nothing to disturb or distract you, then you shall say, he has kept the best wine until now. Think about it, friends. For those who know God, this life is as bad as it ever gets. For those who reject God, this life is as good as it ever gets. You'd rather be on the first part of that equation. Well, let's look at the last couple verses here. Verses 11 and 12, we read. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Look at what it says there in verse 11. It says, this is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. It's fascinating to see that John seems to include in his gospel, and some people think it's a theme running through his gospel, seven signs that Jesus does leading up to his death and resurrection. Seven signs, and each one of those signs says something very powerful. And this is what I want you to see. The very first sign that Jesus performs, what is it all about? It is a sign of conversion, of transformation, of changing water into wine. Remember the water pots filled up to the brim. Jesus didn't add something to what was already there. No, he converted. He transformed what he was there, what was there. Jesus is in the transformation business. And that's how, look at it there in verse 11, how he manifested his glory. Do I need to make the illustration any more plain? You're like a water pot. You're water. You need to be transformed into the wine of God's goodness and love. And it's the transforming power that doesn't. Isn't it beautiful to think that the very first sign that Jesus did in his public ministry was all about transformation, was all about conversion, because that's what Jesus Christ has done in lives for the last 2,000 years. He's transformed them. And I need to ask you, have you had this transforming power in your life? That's what God wants to do. Now, here's the thing about the transforming power is that when we open up our lives to Jesus Christ, it comes in, but all the changes don't happen at once. Some of the changes happen at once. Other ones, God works out progressively through the years and the changing isn't complete until we graduate to glory in heaven. That's when the changing's complete. If you ever meet somebody who purports to be completely transformed, I think you should follow up with a few questions. Better yet, why don't you ask their husband or wife and follow up with a few questions. And you'll find out how completely transformed they are. No, no, no. The completeness of the transformation culminates in our resurrection and our glorification with God. But notice, when they saw the transformation, what did the disciples do? Verse 11 says, his disciples believed in him. Well, what? Didn't they believe in him before? They were his disciples. Yes, they believed in him before, but now they believed in him all the more. And there's something beautiful about that in the Christian life. Have you experienced that? You believe in him, but you believe in him again. You believe in him more and more. 
You know, tonight we're going to do this event, Harvest America. We're going to join with what Greg Laurie is doing in Dallas, Texas. And we're going to be a part of more than 3,000 churches that are linking together to bring this by video broadcast and to preach the gospel. And I know you, but whenever I see somebody preach the gospel really well and give an invitation, isn't there something in you that says, yes, me? You say, wait a minute, I've been a believer for 30 years. But yes, me again. That's a good thing. There's a sense in which it resonates with our heart all over again. Lord, I believe, but I want to believe in you all over again. I want to put my trust in you in a continual, ongoing sense. You know what I think is amazing about this? Think about this miracle. This miracle that was done out of the utter compassion of Jesus. After all, think, if Jesus didn't do this miracle, what would have happened? Okay, a bridal couple would have been embarrassed. And that's bad. It's not nice. But listen, many bridal couples have been embarrassed, haven't they? I think if you probably uh, did a search on YouTube, wedding embarrassments, you could get quite, quite a picture of bridal embarrassments. But friends, here's the thing. It's not the end of the world for a bridal couple to be embarrassed. But Jesus is so good that he wants to relieve even that. And he used his miraculous power to do it. And because of that, the disciples believed. I find it fascinating that it doesn't say that the master of the feast believed. It doesn't say that the bridegroom believed. It doesn't say that even the servants believed. But those who were his disciples, they believed. And so can you. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but up front here, we have something that we don't have every Sunday. We have tables for communion. Because this Sunday, we're having communion together, but we're going to do it in a different way. Instead of handing out the trays with the little cups and the piece of bread, instead, we're going to invite you shortly to come forward and to come to these tables and to take a piece of bread and to dip it in the cup, the large cup that's before you, and to take it. You can either take it right there or take it back to your seat and take it. But friends, don't you see that the cup pictures for us the glorious wine of God's goodness. And that bread, the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. Do you believe? If you believe, you are welcome to come forward at these tables. But honestly, if you say, I don't believe, I reject. If you reject, then it's better for you to stay sitting where you are. Because this is a family meal. It's for those who believe. But here's the thing. When you take it, I want you to ask God, Keep doing that transforming work in my life. I need it. Father, that's my prayer. My prayer, Jesus, is that for every person in whom you have done this genuine work of transformation, that you would continue it, that you would keep it going, that you would do it until finally, Lord, we taste the best wine ever, and that's what we find in your kingdom. So, Lord, I pray that you'd prepare us Prepare us in our heart. Prepare us in our soul to receive from your table. And it's, Lord, it's almost as if we feel that you've invited us to a wedding feast to partake of this with you. Help us with this now, Lord. We receive it by your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.